I've been gone for quite some time, Fire. and since the release of Dragonflight, my mind hasn't been set on making leveling content, instead opting to play the current game's expansion and get a valued opinion on WoW. And after getting my fix of the game and doing quite well in Season 1 in Dragonflight, I figured it was time I came back with a bit of a bang to kickstart content against the channel. And what better way to do so than to return to a grassroots challenge I first did with a class that I swore I'd do last due to how difficult it'd likely be. So here I am again asking, can you beat World of Warcraft using only armor and weapons from Dead? bodies. Now I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what class I'll be taking on this time as I usually do a random spin of the wheel to decide what my next challenge should be, but this time I've decided to take it into my own hands and see to doing what I consider to be one of the worst classes to do this solo challenge for. And believe me, I'm not wrong when I say this will be easily one of the most difficult challenges I've faced. But before that, it's been a few months, let's re-go over the challenge rules. The objective is to get to level 70 using only armor and weapons from dead bodies. I must use the most recent pieces of armor that I loot, with no exceptions. I can't join groups with others, meaning no battlegrounds, arenas, dungeons, or raids, only questing is allowed. I also can't help others kill mobs, as that would help boost my chances of success. However, if someone is to help me, I don't have to reset because I can't tell them not to kill the mobs that they also need. Keep that in mind, it'll be noteworthy later. War mode must be turned on by 20 to 25. Keep that part in mind, it'll be noteworthy later. Finally, all add-ons are turned off except APR for a quick quest turn ins one last thing I'd like to say is a shout out to creators like Nurbit, Deadmeat, and JRose11 for inspiring me to get back into the YouTube spotlight. They didn't say anything directly to me, I just found that what they were doing was interesting enough for me to decide to take another crack at videos and give me an idea of a style that I'll work on melding for my content. Thank you guys, I appreciate you. With that out of the way, I won't blue ball the class anymore as you're about to see what difficulties lie ahead. The class we'll be tackling today is the Rogue, and I'd argue that this is one of the worst runs I'll have when doing this challenge due to the lack of survivability that a Rogue can have with a weapon. Along with the same problems that comes with the warrior via the weapons issue, uh, it also lacks some equipment that the warrior can wear, such as the male and player categories. Can I pull this off, or will I throw my keyboard at my monitor? Let's find out together, shall we? Today's race is the troll because of one thing. Berserker gives you a 10% haste buff for 12 seconds and will likely help you increase auto attack speed in clutch situations. Also, I figured the horde was due another visit because my challenge last video was pretty much an alliance run, so, you know. Let's move on to the next side. I appropriately named the character Who Needs Dags because I think daggers will be lacking a bit in this run and enter the world for one more hoorah. Starting at level 1, I strip myself out of the beginner's gear and proceed onto Tiki Targets. Honestly, the first few levels won't have much to note because I swear Blizzard made this game idiot proof at the start. I quickly gain level 2 and start strangling and punching the local wildlife on a lush island outside of the desert biome. And this is pretty much how things will start until level 5, with the only notable thing being that I'm already starting to see the red screen at the lower levels, indicating just how stupid of an idea this was from the start. And even at level 5, the only noteworthy thing I garner is my first piece of equipment in a pair of boots that my troll cuts off in exchange for ankle bracelets. You better get comfortable with the way that the character's appearance is because this is pretty much the equipment stack I'll have for the foreseeable future. The standard intro plays as it needs to with my defeating Raptor's Naga and eventually the big lady sitting on the sub island before I find myself venturing off into the desert to Duratar. I will note that the quest is already starting to slow down here due to needing a weapon in hand and therefore being unable to use any skills outside of the auto attack feature. After acquiring a stack of grab because I see some struggles beginning to occur, I find myself helping out Sinjin Village for a few more auto punching levels before hitting level 8 and gaining what would be one of the most influential pieces of the rogue's arsenal in Crimson Vial. Its base power gives you 20% of your health back for 4 seconds within a 30 second cooldown and we'll be looking to upgrade that later but for now it works to decrease the time it takes in between mobs. So we wrap off the Northwatch Rebellion storyline and head on over to Razor Hill where I wander around and fill out a few forms to get to level 9 and level 10 without killing a single mob. Now you may be wondering what specialization I'm going to take on, and without a doubt, when I put this up for my idea for a return video, I 100% was going to invest in Outlaw yeah. Rogue. The simple reason for this is the flexibility in weapon choice. Both Assassination and Subtlety Rogue require daggers to use their abilities. In contrast, Outlaw is expanded to any one-handed weapon, meaning that instead of being reduced to only one choice of equipment, if I get a fist weapon, axe, mace, or any other type that are pretty much anything not two-handed, they're not wholly useless. I can actually use them and be able to kind of move on as needed. One thing that is also critical is choosing your next leveling spot. I usually pick one expansion and stick with it, but for this video I decided to expand out to as many expansions of past runs as I've done and give a slight nod to those past challenges. I plan to do one zone of each expansion until I hit level 60, starting with Warlords of Draenor. So we find ourselves in a jungle for another 5 levels where only small things are significant to talk about. For one, my first death almost happens at level 11 because weapons don't really seem to be my friend and orcs are swarming me. However, Khadgar saved me from my first knockout, resetting me to a point 
rate of total health. At level 12, I gained my first attacking ability that doesn't require me to have a weapon in pistol shots. This is huge because it generates combo points for me, allowing me to gain slice and dice procs, which allows me to kill enemies faster with haste and other attacks. Sadly, I still haven't found a weapon by this point of the introduction, but I can still use this combination and Crimson Vials healing to get me through the intro of Draenor and the building of the garrison, which makes me the points to get to level 15. Keep in mind that I'm going through these parts quicker as although they are already showing shines of not being a cakewalk, introducing the first level tends to offer little difficulty. Again, it seems like Blizzard set up an idiot proof system for the beginning of it until the scaling becomes a little bit too much unless you have equipment. That's not to say it's all sunshine and rainbows as at level 15 I garner my first death at the hands of getting greedy for some new equipment. I am a little bit desperate for anything that will give me an edge over mobs as the strategy takes a long time to achieve. However, I do gain the ability to use the garrison function and later go out to find a rare mob sitting out in the open. While I have a hidden rule not to intentionally go rare hunting, if one happens to show up on my screen, I am allowed to go for it, and I do here, which nets me a trinket that I'll be using for most of my levels. I wish I were kidding. After taking over the Bladespire Citadel for the Frost Wolves, I find myself yet another death at the hands of the Thunderlord Oryx as they decide that a naked level 17 troll was more important than the threatened, geared up, fully Frost Wolves decked out in suits of armor. I don't blame them, I mean, you know, look at that hunchback. That's a nice hunchback in it. We're going to be looking at that for the rest of the episode, aren't we? I also acquired Covered Up for my wrist as it's familiar in these runs, but each level is beginning to take its toll as punishment for the lack of equipment. If only I could find a mob that could maybe garner me some leeway because by god this is starting to get difficult. Well, as though WoW was screaming for me to take it seriously, I found this magma worm and started attacking it. I'm hoping for a long haul fight, but then suddenly another player joins in on the combat. As I mentioned, I can't help others, but if they decide to get involved in the action I'm participating in, there isn't much I can do about the circumstance. And after defeating the worm and 18 levels passing, we finally acquire our first weapon, ironically, a dagger. This piece of equipment will save me the heartache of continuing to run as a maverick fist punching troll and introduces me to an actual rotation that I can begin to develop. But if you think just because I have a process now and things are going to suddenly become a cakewalk, you clearly underestimate a good gear's value with scaling mobs. At level 19, gear becomes more frequent as I pick up my first belt off some Thunderlord apprentices near an ancient burial spot. I have the spirit of Anakin in me. But it is not enough to save me from finding one more death at the hands of the Thunderlords striking back during an invasion on one of their outposts. As I said, they must fear trolls in their underwear because despite a fully decked out army behind me, I've become the first piece of dead meat that they spot. It doesn't make any sense to me, but you know what? Uh, uh, welcome to Blizzard's games, ladies and gentlemen. I get the last laugh on this outpost, however, as I am able to take out one of their significant generals with a series of sapping and binding her war guards, followed by slaughtering her and stealing her belt, as well as garnishing one more level to mark the first one-third of the pre-Dragonflight game. After the invasion of their outpost, the Thunderlords figure, hey, it's their turn to attack, so in comes the long, drawn-out process of defending my garrison against their fire. This is likely one of the more annoying things in the early section, as along with several near-death experiences, I got the enjoyment of watching Oryx bug out by standing on top of my outpost, making it impossible for me to kill them. Although eventually the time turned over to the next stage, I can't help but feel, but maybe, just maybe I'm playing a broken game, but since Blizzard is a small indie company, I'll give them a pass. On the way to completing a final mission of Frostfire, I find a boar rare and decide to take it on. Again, another person comes to help, but this time, instead of a straightforward victory, I end up dying from a bleeding effect shortly after the beast goes down. It does turn out to be worth it, however, as I get a sword with increased frost damage and finally get the full effect of dual wielding as the game intended. Thank God. Under the final Battle of Thunder Pass, I end up dying here due to this mammoth giving me a couple of critical hits, which equals about a two shot. I wasn't expecting it, as honestly you can be AFK for most of this quest and not really do anything, but hey, I guess it's my fault for not paying attention to what's happening on screen. Even so, I wrapped up most of the storyline and found myself in Ashran at level 72. Once I leave through the portal, I turn on war mode per the rules and begin my descent into Zul'dazar and the battle for Azeroth storyline. For a couple of levels, nothing happens as with the addition of the new weapons, my loadout is surprisingly okay for this part of the game. I take this time to go ahead and start learning the rotation of an outlaw rogue as, spoilers, I'm not a rogue main by any stretch of the imagination. I did a stint like back in Warlords for a, a little bit, but honestly rogues have never been my class to play outside of that. We managed to get all the way to level 24 before anything noteworthy happens, in which I get a new axe from a rare near one of the main storyline quests. Here I trade out the dagger for a true loadout an outlaw oh. rogue would likely desire, and proceed to dominate for a little while. Well, except for this hiccup here, where I do die to a bleeding effect shortly after killing off an emergency mob, but overall it seems as though I was completely controlling the situation. And then, well, <laughs> this happened. Be
Chicken hook for brain sticky stealing nib grubbing jib snibbling face Yeah, like I said at the beginning, the issue with rogues is the same one with warriors, where the old games version allowed them to use bows to help pull mobs. Sadly though, while that mechanic of the game went away, the weapon usage of said ranged weapons did not. So whenever I see something like this happen, I have to relinquish both of my melee weapons in exchange for this piece of useless equipment. And what can I do with a bow? Absolutely nothing. The rogue doesn't even have the shoot mechanic anymore, so it's essentially back to punching mobs in the face and hoping I do enough damage with pistol shot and evasive cooldowns to garner a win. Although I've somewhat gained the idea of what a rogue should be like, that doesn't entirely mean I'm comfortable with what occurs next. Case in point, at level 25 I accumulate 3 more deaths from different sources. The first comes from this angry dinosaur who is more than challenging to try to rip apart with bare hands. I would have a shiv available to calm him down, but as we've established, shiv requires a melee weapon. The second death comes from a boss mob, which while I can put up a good fight, eventually it exhausts all my options and it takes me out after a long, like, dried out dance. And the final death from the level comes from yet another one of these TE boss mobs, and I'll be honest, this was more my fault than anything, as I didn't expect the mechanics I encountered with them. Even so, the damage I deal is abysmal and causes a wipe. The death train keeps going as even when I get to level 76, I die in a close call fight with a Mogu while trying to help the Zandalari take back a warport. This is going to be a common thing that comes out throughout this video, as I'm too stubborn to quit arguments early on if they're down to the wire like this. Don't worry, I do try to learn later. Kind of. We'll see. I get one more pair of gloves from a rare after smartly grabbing a couple NPCs to help me kill it, but without a weapon to handle some of the worst of what's to come, I'm afraid any regular armor just is not gonna do here. Well, my prayers are answered as when I get to level 27, after fighting off the big bad warlord at the warport, he rewards my patience with a one-handed axe. Man, that was a mouthful. Finally, my damage can be at least half as good as it was. Only some of my abilities are back, while others require dual wielding, however, I'll take what I can get if it means I never have to punch another mob for the rest of the run. I later get a worse pair of gloves from killing off a lower betrayer, cutting my stats down as punishment for my ability to get new equipment, and those apparently didn't matter as I would die to the next betrayer immediately afterwards. Part of that is also hubris though, as I'm not a patient individual and wanted to be done recording within 3 days. Spoiler alert, this challenge took a full 4 days to complete, and you're gonna see why soon, but for now, let's just keep on moving. We'll get another lightning round of deaths for each level starting at 28, where I succumb to a fate stinger in yet another close call yeah. fight. Level 29 was left up in the air when I tried to escape a fight with no cooldowns, yeah. and then again at level 30 when yet another close call. As I said, I tend to be stubborn when it comes to these uh, close call combats, and I don't consider critical ranges or bleed effects when I die, so it becomes expected yeah. at that point. However, despite all that, we do manage to convince the final part of Zulza's storyline without any more deaths and equipment. And at level 30, I can set off to my next destination in the Cataclysm Zones, precisely Mount Hyjal. I end up in yet another combat situation here where I almost certainly would have won if I had a couple of crits in my favor, and yet I can't clutch it out against an incinerator. But after that, well, I mean, things begin to kind of come into shape. Because at level 31, I acquire a dagger that cements my dual wellness status once again, and for about really 13 levels, nothing outside of the occasional piece of loot happens. You might think I was dreading the entire run by how I've been rambling on and on, but at this point, there was a sweet spot that occurred in the playthrough where death slowed down for the longest time, and while yes, I was still getting some pieces of equipment here and there, nothing significant stood out to a point where it was worth mentioning. Oh sure, I did end up having a gimmick death at level 34, but that was more my fault than anything else as I wasn't doing the mechanics of the boss fight properly. So here, I'll give you a quick sum up of what I did through this. I got gloves at level 32, more gloves at 33, a fist slip in at 35, even more gloves at 36, a wrist at 37, oh surprise, yet another pair of gloves at level 38, a dagger at 39, and then nothing for 5 straight levels until I got to level 43. During this time, a new mechanic was introduced via pickpocketing mobs, and I had a strange question. Do items I pickpocket or lockpick count against me? It, it took me a minute to think about it, but I had decided on this with like the mini rules. If I pickpocket a mob, I have to kill it, indicating it as a rogue being more careful to check for items on a corpse. As for lockboxings, anything inside of them is fair game as long as it comes off a dead body. After all, if you get killed and someone steals your bag and the contents inside, was only the purse stolen or everything inside? You might not like these rules, but ultimately I figured I have to have a mini route of uh, ideas or uh, you know rules for this, and spoilers here, it wouldn't matter much after Mount Hajjal anyway, so you know, take that out what you will. Speaking of which, what happened at level 43? Well, 43 marked the beginning of a couple more death streaks as I'd lose yet another fight to a close call with one of the ending mobs in Mount Hajjal. Yes, so little happened between the beginning and the end that this is how far we've gotten. 
At 44, I would skin off a leather helmet off the mother of a Twilight Rake before having a fluke death at the hands of Ragnaros in the final quest at the mountain. Apparently, a naked troll is worth more killing than one of the Guardians of the World, and his gambit was correct, as with my death, we had to restart the fight. Next attempt, and this time he decides rather than killing me outright, he can use AoE damage to take me down to death. And again, he was successful, forcing the rest of the team to give up for some reason. I guess I'm so valuable that a retreat needs to be called in the case of my lost. Thankfully, he dies on the third attempt, wrapping up the Hygel storyline and getting us to the next plot where we plan to go. The Shadowlands awaits. Nothing of note happens at the beginning of Shadowlands and Bastion's storyline, mainly because it's all dialogue and fetch quests. Still, once I hit level 47 and take on this Praetorian, I get obliterated by a shitty hitbox that struck me for damage I should have not taken. I'm starting to get flashbacks of when this was the end boss of my challenge pains. But unlike the Shadowlands run of old, I am not nearly as bombarded with deaths as they seem much more sparse. The subsequent death occurs three levels after at level 50 where I die fighting the elite Lysonia. Despite being bare bones equipped, I somehow still do more damage than the others around me for some strange reason, I, I couldn't tell you why. And what's funny about this is this wasn't the only death at this level as I would end up dying to a piercing memory two seconds before my vanish was ready to be reused. But by this stage of the challenge, I was starting to realize that close calls weren't as close as they they were initially seeming, and I started to try to take less risk, but considering I'm an all-risk player, that wasn't saying much. Out of those blunders, it seems as though I was learning, however, as there were no real actions to speak of up to level 35, the exception being that I acquired yet another belt at level 53. I'm beginning to think there's something that Blizzard is trying to tell me with how many belts I've got in this run. All the same, I do the rest of the Bastion storyline in peace and don't die a single time after that piercing memory, making it to the final spot before the Dragonflight expansion. The Jade Forest of Pandaria is where I thought I'd have minor issues in the game, as the beginning parts up to Grooken Hill felt almost like a good tutorial and introduction to the game. However, the lack of gear and some unfortunate timing would be my pitfall and one of many that would start to occur at this point in the run. You see, Pandaria had many spots where multiple mobs were cramped together, forcing you to basically fight them all simultaneously, which posed a problem for me going forward. Forward. As long as I could do fights 1v1, I was able to come out on top, but against the team? Even with Outlaw's alleged impressive AoE damage, I wasn't built enough with equipment to sustain a sound output in damage. This would mean that at level 55, I'd die in Twin Spire Keep to the Shaw during one of my first AoE fights, and then again in the same place, just a little further down the Keep. Now, I probably could have done more here, but things were beginning to heat up just a bit in this final push to Dragonflight, and this didn't become more apparent until I had hit level 56. Strong our airship should be rewarded for how much it slowed me down because I kid you not, I spent almost 45 minutes at this base just trying to figure out different strategies for defeating all the mobs here. Let's review the list of problems. First, one mob wasn't even beatable. The medics in this area spam first aid on themselves and I couldn't do enough damage to outperform their healing even with all my cooldowns set. This would mean that fights could take up a long time resulting in either a loss or a force to retreat. As a result, I didn't kill a single medic while I was on that airstrip. The second thing is the boss fights before Captain Doran. The gnomes weren't really the worst as I could sap one of them and kill the other before turning my attention to kill the second, but the dwarf death knight was putting out massive DPS numbers and aim shot from Corporal Jackson was enough to one shot my character twice before I'd finally do a spin around the tower to beat him. Cover that with Blizzard's crappy line of sight rules regarding trees and oh boy did I have a tough time beating these guys. But then there was Captain Doran himself. This guy made my strategy what would be my Dragonflight experience canon. Essentially, he knocked me down so quickly that I'd have to blind him and wait a full minute for my Crimson Vial to heal me. And at this point, I had fully empowered it to cure 35% damage instead of the 20% I had at the beginning. His blade storm followed me around, which caused me to use Kidney Shot more often. And although it would not hit me immediately, his hack and slash method would at least tick me for 1k damage. And even when he got into his shell form, he could still kill me at least once due to his spin mechanic. I was not anticipating this to be a severe roadblock, and yet it was. And the worst part? How many deaths did I end up dying at this location? You're probably thinking maybe like three or four, but nope. I ended up dying eight times in this part before finally defeating the captain and moving on to the next chapter. But I'll be damned if this level didn't foreshadow how I'd end up fighting for the rest of the challenge. The one saving grace? I got a pair of pants. So at least my monetization is saved. Yay! Ah, yeah. Speaking of which, like and subscribe so that I can worry about that sort of thing. Woohoo!
Now, you might be thinking at the rest of that the Jade Forest is a slog, but you'd be far from the truth there. In fact, the Jade Forest mobs spread out quite a bit after the airstrip, causing levels 58 through 60 to be free, with getting yet another pair of gloves at level 58 and a ring at level 59. I wish there was more of a climactic fight to get to 60, but outside of fighting this elite alliance guy just because I thought it'd be an exciting encounter, there isn't much that occurs here. However, Dragonflight would end the deathless levels and pull in a new era of difficulty to the game that I couldn't have predicted on the horizon. Oh boy, Dragonflight. Well, we finally made it to the current content of WoW Focus, and I have to admit, it didn't disappoint in making this an actual challenge. Now keep in mind, up to this point, I've technically only done one challenge in the Dragonflight expansion, and that run was so gimmicky that, of course, it would have been a problematic attempt no matter how you shaped it. But to level a character normally through the game wouldn't be so difficult, would it? Upon arriving in Dragonflight, I originally intended to play the game like you were an average level 60 who didn't have the advantage of already having gone through the storylines at least once. That idea quickly found itself shut down at the ready, and you'll see why soon, but for now, just know that the death counts are about to get high with no signs of stopping. At first, the levels weren't so bad, as the game is trying to ease you into the recently fresh 60 into the new expansion by keeping it about the same scale of difficulty as you were at the end of your time walking experience. Here I thought that maybe my gear would scale along with the levels if I saw some drops from mobs to help me prepare for the game's content. After all, even with the 60s being scaled, rares were still borderline impossible to kill without gimmicks, so I didn't even bother trying. Instead, the initial levels were met with 5 additional deaths that callied to this character. The first came from a rare that I tried to kill inside this hidden cave. I know I said I didn't try, but I wanted to do it at least once to see what could happen. The second came from an alliance member randomly throwing and hitting me with a one-shot paladin hammer. Yes, war mode will be playing a significant impact on my count here, don't you worry. The third came from a close called fight ruined by a second mob appearing and killing me to Together. This was like a classic WoW style of death right here. The fourth came from an alliance member stealing my rare attempt for a kill, causing me to run off and then get killed shortly afterwards with no natural way to survive. And then the final came from one that was primarily my fault due to being stubborn and taking a risk on killing mobs before it killed me. This also marked the first recording chunk that took me more than an hour to do so, as I typically split the recordings into levels that have an accessible records of what occurred in what group, and this trend doesn't really seem to go away for the rest of the video, so the challenge took me about four days to complete instead of of three because Dragonflight scaling basically bummed me out and took more than 10 hours. But believe me when I tell you this wouldn't be the last time this game started getting complicated and with that war mode rule, yeah that's really where this rule starts to come into play. Let's move on to level 61. Hopefully we'll see a piece of equipment here to make this a little bit easier. Well I wish that were in case, instead we hit an actual wall. It was foreshadowing in a quest called Basalt's Assault, I think that's how you say it, where I was tasked with killing four enraged cliff monsters which only required you to get them to half HP for the actual credit. Well, these guys were hard hitting individuals rapidly draining my health when I even got close to them. It was at this point that the blinding strategy against Captain Doran earlier began to become my saving grace for this run. And I'm not going to lie, if I didn't swap my talents at some point to increase the effectiveness of blind, I don't think I would have completed this run. All the same, I do end up killing them off, but not before they alone would tack on another of three deaths in my count. I'll go ahead and spoil it for you, there are about two more deaths on the count here, and those come from encounters that I decided was a complete wall that stopped my regression in the waking shores. In the next quest, Proto Fight, you are tasked with killing three elite Proto Jakes by using a spear that reduces the damage you take, while increasing the damage they take tenfold. The problem? I don't deal nearly enough damage for that to matter. Even if by some miracle I could implement the Doran strategy, as I'd like to call it now, I would still struggle to get past the Storming Drake's magical capabilities. The Rumbling Ones were a better choice, but their stuff was still a pigeonhole in difficulty, resulting in my denies another couple of times. And with me only getting so close to realize that I was entirely out of options, I opted to stop the Waking Shore storyline for now, and I flew away with some desperation and went to the Anaran Plains to see if there were going to be similar circumstances there. And although I did have some tricky spots, it wasn't the primary source of difficulty that the Waking Shore storyline turned out to be. I would end up doing my leveling up here and completing this line before heading off, but there were still some difficult moments. For one, my following two deaths at the same level came from the Alliance players just meandering around killing off the characters, which I potentially still had to deal with. But levels 62 to 63 were probably the most uneventful of the Dragonflight challenge. I attribute some of this to finally getting a handle on the Doran strategy, as it made dealing with mobs somewhat more manageable when you can blind something for a whole minute, which gives you two Crimson Vials to heal and reset your stats. But there is a 
a downside to the strategy, the wait time for it to fully take place is probably one of the biggest ones. You could be fighting a mob for 5 minutes and there is a lot that can go wrong in that time. My first death of level 62 came from an alliance player who killed me before I could finish off my strategy and stole my kill, causing me to reset and try again. The second time it happened was from the actual boss, Sheila the Windbinder herself. I accidentally clicked on the button in a panic and I pulled her out of blind and caused her to finish me off. And the final one came from a whole minute waiting a blind, only to have two mobs spawn next to the one I wanted to kill, and uh, though I would get my target, the others would take me out shortly afterwards. But if this were the strategy I'd have to implement to stand a chance, then so be it. But as it turned out, even with a good plan, this still had some severe pitfalls. Case in point, the next level. If you're wondering, the Onara Plains main storyline was beaten after a, a couple of little hiccups, and it was by far one of the easiest zones to deal with. Azure Span, however, uh, was a different story. The very, and I mean very, very beginning part of this band wasn't all too difficult, save for one death from an alliance member in the middle of the city. Yes, that's how brazen they are. But then I got to Caligos' tower storyline and, well, things really just started to fall apart here. I haven't got the capacity nor the ability to take on the arcane damage being dealt in constant droves, and even with my newly placed strategy, I still found myself dying to crits in a somewhat unlucky roll when it came to my combat. I kid you not, I spent almost the entire hour of this recording sitting here killing arcane elementals to get the storyline moving eventually. I didn't abandon it because I figured so long as I could actually get the kills, then it'd be fine. Not that it mattered though, as once I did get past this portion of the story, there were arcane mana worms at the top ready to assault me with physical and magical damage to make a significant impact. After seeing just how much I really couldn't do here, I left the storyline as well to go ahead and see if Thaldrasis would be a better result but not before etching another 10 deaths into my counter. Mind you, up until this point, not a single piece of gear has dropped, so I'm still stuck with the same armor I've had since pre-Dragonflight and nothing but deaths to mark on my notepad. We move on to Thaldrasis, where the counts of deaths didn't stop here entirely, but it felt miles easier than the Azura Span storyline. The initial opener to the story was tricky, as my first and second deaths came from dual wielding and triple primal spy gangs. As I previously established, anything more than a 1v1 is near impossible for me to beat, so I died in the middle of Valdraken. I know I'm not supposed to be looking for help here, but come on, are people really going to watch a guy die to mobs? Apparently the answer is both yes and no, as the second time I go to them, I instantly get help and watch as they melt before me. Again, the run remains valid, so long as I don't instigate or uh, jump in on someone else's kill, so you know what? Getting help, whatever. Despite these bits of difficulty, I would end up only dying one more time due to a misclick for Cloak of Shadows before finally getting to level 64. 14 deaths occurred in this one level, and indeed, it doesn't get much worse than this, right? Surely. Well, you're gonna have to find out if it does, but this next level, spoilers, isn't the one that will do it. The first thing I go for is a rare in the Bronze Dragonflight zone. I was tired of being severely undergeared and I thought to try the Doran strategy on rares. As it turned out, it can work, but only if you're precise and deliberate in your movements. It took me a long time to get this rare down and when I finally did, I got an intellect trinket that proved useless to me. Yay, intellect so trinket. The very first piece of equipment I get in Dragonflight is one of the most useless things that, that I could that possibly that get. That that well, after doing some time while quests that are surprisingly decent, I've, I've got to give uh, uh, Blizzard credit for that one, I found myself killing off Murlocs and the like to garner some percentages for a search. Usually tasks that require this sort of attention are bothersome, but I was happy to do it. At this point, seeing no drops of note to my character was beginning to grate on me, and so I was intentionally seeking out easy fights for lower percentage counts, and, you know, I was trying to see if I could get any gear at this point, really, to help me boost out of this, you know, rut I seem to be sitting in. You could argue this is farming mobs, which I have another unwritten rule not to do, but honestly, as long as they go towards a quest objective, I I'm not about to write my way out of a chance for some mob experience, so here we are. Still, the chaos of doing this only gave me three more deaths with nothing else to really show. The next step was taking over the Broad's Hourglass to help break off the wards to stop Eternus, and boy oh boy this didn't prove easy. I only died once here, but that was because of a glitch I exploited to make this possible. If you move out of the conflux zones, it shows off an alternate plane where the wardens have complete control, and if you do this enough times, you can get a setup where mobs are somewhat confused about where they're supposed to be in the phase. This results in splitting them off where you have enough of a shot to kill some of them while they're in one phase, and then reload back and kill the others in the other phase. It took a long time to do it as the sharding seems to have a specific time you need to push in, but we eventually got it done. Even still, there were only 4 deaths for level 64, so things were looking better compared to the previous level. But if you thought the days of double digit deaths were over, you would be mistaken. Level 65 hosted a whopping 12 deaths over a 3 hour recording. Yes, 
three hours were taken for this one level. Some of that was spent trying to figure out what to do as the ending of Thaldrasus' storyline was quick approaching, but with no gear still in sight, the two walls I had from the other zones would still likely be impossible to do, so let's get a highlight of what occurred. My first death came from one of the temporal times I died to in the Black Empire. After that, I spent far too much time on a side quest in the Waking Shores, specifically this fire elemental, Baron Ashflow. I spent about 30 minutes and 4 deaths trying to figure out a way around this elemental, as his damage output was enough for me to constantly have to deal with him casting spells, and I had minimal move pulls to actually stop him from doing so. Although the Doran strategy was working, it wasn't ultimately enough for me to defeat him on my own, as the final blow came from somebody else who charged in and attacked the mob while I was still in the middle of the fight. Shortly afterwards, I would die to a water elemental in yet another close encounter. Due to the scaling, critical hits became a severe factor in the close fight. In fact, there would be several moments where it seemed like I was on the verge of victory, and then I'd be smacked for a third of my health and go down like a brick. Then this started to occur where I was getting walled off doing side quests because even boss fights at the end of them was becoming too difficult to take on. Case in point with this vermin whose fight continued for so long, another spawned on top of the first one and the duo bosses proceeded to kill me. I was so sure at this rate that the four elementals had kicked my tail and it forced me to use a slower strats to power through the rest of this game. Two hours into this level and I finally acquired a chess piece. Granted, it was one of those useless gray item ones, but any resistance to physical hits was better than nothing, so I put it on immediately and then got smacked by the full fury of Nathan Power. Alright, this quest also seems to be going into a wall with a big boss battle at the end. Let's see if we can kill off some plane striders instead and, yeah, surprise, I get attacked by three of them and end up dying shortly afterwards. I do manage to gather the reagents from a wild beast for a quest and then go back to the Mudfin Village where one of them blesses me with a pair of pants to match my shirts. So now I'm a lackluster dapper troll instead of the outright punching one for the beginning of the challenge. I am still dying a lot more however. Finally after about 3 hours and 3 minutes I hit level 66 and marched towards the latter half of this challenge run. Level 66 has its variations of deaths but at least it's a little less than our previous counterpoint. Could this be the start of the decline? Have we finally reached the easy part of the run? Let's find out and get to the kills. Maybe I should get a kill count for this video. The good news is that the first noteworthy piece of flying around and doing side quests is finally getting a new pair of shoes to replace the ones I got back at level 5. Granted, they're once again poor quality, but again, any damage resistance is better than nothing, so I take them and proceed to get walled immediately afterwards. My first death of the level came from fighting another rare turtle that I flew over. I figured the Doran strategy would have worked, but honestly, it seemed as though it only sometimes has a shot as certain mobs just have many mechanics to deal with, and despite my moveset being fixed to try to stop set mechanics, I would still find myself dying to them. Subsequent deaths came from a Sundering Flame Protector with a Magical Bubble, which if broken, shoots my character, so it's a slow slog of killing this guy, running away when he bubbles, and then coming back in, along with Blinding Doors oh, trying to leave this guy, I kid you not, took me about 10 minutes to kill by himself. Shortly after defeating him, it was time for the big boss of this quest, where I took on a giant dragon in combat. It was a matter of wriggling my way around, slogging my vials, making the mines, getting the hits, and I was seemingly clear for him. Unfortunately, he did get a bleed off of me, followed by a whopping 15 15k critical hit that knocked my health from 25% to zero. So, that's nice to see. He would kill me one more time, but we'd eventually get to kill on high pox only after, you guessed it, someone else showed up in the middle of the fight. It seems like we were on our way to the verge of victory anyway, but this quick ending of assurance did wonders here. I then get one more under my belt after a bleed effect knocks me down from a blind stack. I kid you not, even taking damage at this point feels like someone is ripping defenses through my paper thin armor. After another death of trying to fight a rare only to be flopped by a mob spawning next to it, I was out in the woods trying to kill flying bats, spiders, and kodos, succumbing to at least one of them in each trek to gain some nature equipment. It seemed that the mother herself had gotten so tired of my antics that anything can take a crack at me if it gets in the mood. There's three more deaths added to the counter. That might have been a joke until the final death of my level you came from this bullfrog that decided it's, yeah, mother nature is so pissed that even frogs could take it down anymore. I wish I was already at the end of this run. With over two hours of recording for this one, we make it to level 67, or as I'd like to call it, the worst level in this run. I wish I could tell you we figured out everything here and it was finally a finish to the times I found myself face planting on the floor. Instead, we only exceeded the amount by doing something that I questioned whether or not it was the right call at this point in the recording. The problem was that most of the side quests in the zones were drying up, and with only a few levels to go, I needed to look to unlock some more of them. I did that by finally returning and challenging the Proto Drake's quest in the Waking Shore. Now, granted, I didn't immediately go back there. Instead, I exhausted most of the Azura Span side stuff that was immediately available at the start of the zone, but 
overall I was slowly running out of options without the main storylines being progressed. So after one death and trying to kill an elite mob, it came back to me trying to get the proto drakes down. And I wouldn't be lying if I didn't spend at least an hour trying to kill off these drakes. It probably was closer to an hour and a half to be honest. My strategy only worked if specific things happened and it required patience and discipline to the highest degree. And I'll try to go ahead and lay it out here. After trial and error on these proto drakes, I commenced to take on the rumbling versions due to the nature of their physical attacks. I needed a vast open space to run around and roam to get out in the open, and I needed to rely heavily on blinding and Dorn strategies to win. The fight would have me open up with an ambush and use a spear, followed by popping my evasion right at the beginning of the battle. I'd blow all my cooldowns to pump as much damage into the dragon as possible. If he crits or does enough to get me to red bar, I need to go ahead and blind him, or I'd die. If I see the bleeding effect or blind ability, I must interrupt it or I die. Once the offensive cooldowns were all down or my survivability tactics ran out, I'd blind him for one minute. Typically the drake would be about half healthy, give or take. The goal of the second round of attack is not to go for the kill but to survive. Blind with a reduction in its CD is only about a minute and a half and so that's 30 seconds for the drake to attack. With no defensive cooldowns, I need to keep this thing from shooting me down as much as possible. So I apply crippling poison, wait until the blind completely goes out and then throw a spear at it for a stun. I'd build my combo points, use gouge for a 4 second stab, and then kidney strike for another 4 seconds. Then with crippling poison of pride, I'd run away from the drake, using a vial likely, and would wait out the timer in which the blind comes back up. I get all my offensive cooldowns back and nuke him down the rest of the way. Although it finally net me the kill, this strategy had a low chance of winning due to sometimes being crit for a flat 30k. And if that happened, I was as good as dead or needing to go ahead and reset. On top of that, I tried fighting this guy on a ledge where I thought I had enough room and then when I saw it wasn't working, I went back to a shelf that I had killed the first drake on and had gotten it. After that, I finally got the 3 kills I needed to progress the questline. Now I will say that something that did help was when I went and fought a rare with the strategy to test it out, I was successful in getting into the battle and along with that success I'd finally gotten a pair of gloves, you guessed it, that would moderately be useful in increasing my stats a bit. They were cloth and the intellect did nothing for me but still everything else about them gave me something to work with including a 320 stamina increase which was significant in a victory for vitality points. Even still, the number of failures cost me about 13 deaths and I wish I could stay at stop there, but there was one more bit of this I still needed to encounter, the big boss after the proto drakes. With a strategy in hand, I had the upper advantage and was about to win against her, especially since her moves were less devastating than the proto drakes, but then out of nowhere, two alliance members came up and killed me, taking all the progress I had to finish the drake. So. I stopped, went and killed a rare to take a break, and was doing the strat again only to have another alliance player attack the rare. At the same time, it was blind, so when it pulled out of that, it turned around, still arguing to me, and hit me for a one shot. And I got so livid that I ended up attacking this player and caused them to lose progress on the rare and wipe out. If you are seeing this, whoever you are, I do apologize because I don't think you were trying to be malicious like everyone else who had done that up to this point. It was just one of those things that built up over several instances of a lot of players getting in my way and racking up my accounts. So I hope you can have a good day and again, I'm sorry. Thank you. Now after this, I went back in and killed off the boss at the questline with no interruptions and proceeded on to the rest of the storyline. I would end up dying one more time to a side quest mob, mostly because I wasn't expecting the one shot, but after that I pretty much was on the road to level 68 and with that, with a little over 2 hours into it, it tallied up to 17 deaths, the highest number so far, in pretty much any of my challenges. Like I don't think I had actually ever gotten to that high of a number at any point. And so now 68 comes up, and I figure the worst of it is over, which is partially true, as I'll say this, the count of deaths doesn't get higher than that. But it comes pretty darn close. Let's list the side of deaths before the main event. I end up dying to a group of mobs as I again have no way of killing off 2 mobs together, let alone really 4. I die later in a boss fight due to not interrupting properly and being destroyed in a one shot circle. Remember that abilities at this point are one shotting me so I had to be extremely careful to not die to something from which most players would have a few more graces at this point in the level. And for a while I was wrapping up many side quests in the waking shore and moving back to the Azure span. Now you might think I was done with the quest there since I couldn't progress the main storyline but there is one more link off that allows me to go to camp nowhere and do the feral ball quest line there. Unfortunately, this proved to be a mistake as my next hour will be spent on one quest where you're trying to save one of the furbogs from the clutches of a powerful warlord. Now, the problem with this quest is that it also happened to be a world quest, so you'd see many 70s sweeping in to do it for their rep. And with many 70s came a lot of alliance players who come in and steal kills from me since the guy I wanted to kill also counted to their count. 
I kid you not, despite this strategy pretty much being foolproof at this point, the only way I got it done was by some horde member coming in and killing him while I was in the middle of doing it. Because otherwise, I'd be around the 25% marker with the guy, only have some random person fly out of nowhere and kill me. And if that did happen, or some other bullshit would occur, it would cause my demise, and then I'd have to reset everything. From this one quest alone, 13 of my deaths were tacked on for stupid reasons like this one. Door mode makes it all the more challenging and it adds another element to the task. Still, I couldn't help but feel I was getting a lot more shafted here than usual for an expansion because I didn't have nearly this many issues in Shadowlands. Which is a good and bad thing to be completely honest. Good for the player base, not so good for a challenge like this. This level ends on a high note by giving me a pair of shoes for all my trouble and then we go into the final stretch at level 69. And you might think this is the final slugfest at the end of the tunnel. After all, it's the final level, and with most of my runs, the last level I'll use usually the hardest one with twists, turns, and everything in between. But I'll be 100% honest here, this was probably the second most manageable run in the Dragonflight part of this expansion. I was just as surprised as you to note this, and, and don't get me wrong, I still had deaths, but they were minor in comparison to what I deal with up until this point. So let's take a glance. So the final level started with me fighting a boss inside of a cave, and honestly, though my strat had been solidified at this point, she still got the best of me because I was focusing my efforts in the wrong spot. I had sapped her and blinded one of the minions while I worked to deal with the other. I, however, died because eventually one of the minions broke free, and by that point I had no blinds or anything to protect myself from death. The second time I had killed the second minion while sapping her and then went after the boss, but by then I didn't have enough to finish her off, so I decided to go for a sap and blind the minions before going directly at her for a third attempt. She doesn't attack until the minions are down, so I use this to my advantage, killing off one of the mobs and then blinding the other before taking her on. The three deaths occurred fighting here. At this point, the only way I expect to reach this zone ultimately was by covering the final parts of the main storyline, and so I did just that. By this point, I had a complete strategy to deal with the mana worms at the top, and I didn't die once of them before talking to Kalagos and moving on to the final parts of the quest. I would die one more time to a boss at Mage's Rest, but it was because of my own faults at this point. An Alliance player came up to help me finish it, and so just as I died, he went ahead and got the killing blow. Um, but, you know, I still got the credit for that. So shout out to that guy. You made the final recording session somewhat more tolerable. I wish I could have helped you get the kill on the Echo, but, you know, unfortunately my rules said that I could not do that. And with that, things were finally starting to look up. There was a rare that I decided to try to kill with the Doran Strat, but almost immediately upon combat with them, two horde members showed up and fought it with me, garnering me a pair of pants that had great stats on them and was right up my alley for my class. After this, I had an increased armor hat, again, garbage, but it still proved helpful, and I had help from Caligos from any quest that I needed to do here, and what I couldn't conquer alone, he was there to usually help me with. Moreover, many of the Azure Spans quests after Caligos Tower seemed to be more focused on talking to people and having help from NPCs. As a final piece of victory, I acquired a powerful trinket from a mob that resulted in me using it to slam mobs with a more powerful fire attack. And by that point, I was one bar away from finishing the task, and that final fuck you to this quest, I killed a primal and got a crappy belt, hitting level 70 and proving that you can beat World of Warcraft with only armor and weapons from dead bodies. Oh my god, that was a long mouthful of stuff to narrate. The total time took me just under 40 hours with 125 deaths exactly the boot. My advice to all of you watching is don't do this. This was an insane challenge and honestly I only kept going on this character because I had already reached Dragonflight and things were looking good up until that point. I looked it up afterwards and greed items in Dragonflight had an astronomically low chance of dropping. We're talking like 1% or lower, so it wouldn't be viable to do this. I may still do it again at some point because I'm crazy, but I knew rogues were going to be one of the tough ones to complete. In any case, take care and I will see you in the following video. Bye bye. Yep.